Listen, I'm going to be 100% honest because that's the only way I know. Hey, Daddy. And then both and Derek react. <laughs> oh, my God. The Nick can riddle me that. Becoming a werewolf was literally a highlight of my life. What the Nick and doesn't understand is that I am the master of the dad joke. Just being able to find so much joy in Teen Wolf. Welcome to Return to Beacon Hills, a Teen Wolf Rewatch podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Cliss Mollis, and I'm joined by Kate Coffin and Will Wallace. Every week, we'll be watching and talking about the hit MTV series one episode at a time. And this week, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 21, The Fox and the Wolf. If you're watching Teen Wolf for the first time and you're worried about spoilers, have no fear. This podcast is broken up into two sections, Alpha and Beta. The Beta section is for first-timers who are just now finding this awesome series and don't want to be spoiled about what's to come. The second section, Alpha, is where we go full spoilers and talk about not just the current episode, but the entire Teen Wolf series, as well as its place in the fandom. In the show notes of your podcast app of choice, you'll find time codes for the Alpha and Beta sections. If you'd like to support the show, you can find us on Patreon at RTBH Podcast. There, our Wolfie patrons will gain access to awesome exclusives like, like early access to episodes, full moon AMAs, the Beacon Hills Movie Club, where we watch and provide commentary for movies starring the amazing cast of Teen Wolf and featuring the work of our talented crew, as well as guest video interviews and a monthly watch party. So head on over to patreon.com slash RTBH podcast and join the pack. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at RTBH podcast and Tumblr and TikTok at Return to Beacon Hills. If you'd like to ask us questions or offer suggestions for future topics to discuss, you can email us at return to Beacon Hills at gmail.com. This week's episode is entitled The Fox and the Wolf. It was written by Ian Stokes and directed by Tim Andrew. In it, Styles attacks Ken to try and get his hands on the last of Nishiko's Kitsune tales. Nishiko, Kira, and Scott come to the school to help. Nishiko tells them how the Nagitsune was created, recounting her time at a secret internment camp during World War II. Meanwhile, Stelinski gets Chris and Derek out of jail and enlists their help, as well as Allison's, in tracking Styles. Kira gains a powerful weapon, but it's Stelinski who finds Styles, and he might not be styles anymore. Our favorite quote for this week is an exchange between Scott, Noshiko, Kira, and Ken. Scott says, if that's you, then you'd have to be like 90 years old. Noshiko says, closer to 900. Kira says, okay, sure. Why not? Dad, how old are you? Ken says, 43, but I've been told I look mid-30s. Oh, Ken bringing all the dad energy to this incredible supernatural conversation (laughs) that's happening right now (laughs) i know i love his delivery of that it's just so good yeah tom's uh tom's pretty great our honorable mention also involves noshiko although it was many years ago she said oh my god is that chocolate and reese says i thought you liked it when i'm tough noshiko says i like chocolate more (laughs) chocolate's good woman after my own heart before we begin a quick bit of history While the Oak Creek internment camp is fictitious, the U.S. government did round up people of Japanese descent and imprison them in camps from 1942 to 1946. Over 125,000 people were incarcerated in these camps, most of them American citizens. Many more were legal residents, but were ineligible to become citizens because they were born in Japan. However, some of the prisoners were relocated from Latin America. In 2011, a federal investigation found that the FBI and FCC had issued a report before the internment called the Ringel Report, which concluded that Japanese Americans were not a national security threat. The Solicitor General at the time buried the report to support President Roosevelt's incarceration orders. Roosevelt himself referred to them as concentration camps. An estimated 1,800 people died in these camps, mostly due to unsanitary conditions and inadequate medical care. There were also seven confirmed cases of people being shot to death due to uprisings or escape attempts. Teen Wolf touches on both these outcomes, though the details of internment are significantly changed here to fit the plot and production constraints. To ensure we remember the past and aren't condemned to repeat it, we recommend learning a little more about this dark point in American history if you didn't learn about it at adequately in schools. In World War II, there was a unit of soldiers known as the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, all Japanese American soldiers, and they were all recruited out of internment camps in the United States. It was kind of done as a, we're not that bad, says the government. Look, they can fight for us. And they thought they would get like 10 or 12 volunteers. They got 3,000. 
Holy and shit. many of them won a ridiculous amount of Purple Hearts. There were also many uh, Medals of Honor given posthumously. And one man named Daniel Inouye was such a badass that in Italy, when he was fighting with his men, he was running up a hill, leading them, got shot. His arm got shot off. He oh rolled God. down a hill. All of his men raced to him to make sure he was okay. And when he came to, he said, are all the Germans dead? And they were like, no. He says, well, get the f- up the hill. And then he, <laughs> he, and then he went off with his missing arm. And he Damn. then later became a senator from Hawaii and got a uh, Medal of Honor afterwards. So, uh, yeah, 442nd Regimental Combat Team, incredible men who fought for a country who hated them. And it was incredible. And now let's dive into the episode. We begin with a flashback to 1943. Two soldiers unload bodies from a truck while one annoys the other with riddles. Glad you're both so f- casual about this. Yeah, the episode jumps right into the atrocity. Even being a teenage werewolf show on MTV, it's good that this at least starts a discussion about something that a lot of American kids aren't taught in history class. Another portrayal, one with more realism, is the musical Allegiant starring George Takei, which will open in London in January. It was inspired by his experiences in an internment camp as a child. It's actually pronounced National Treasure, George Takei? Yes, sorry. (laughs) <laughs> no, but he he has done a lot for the queer community and the Asian American community. He's won a GLAAD award and a medal from the Japanese American National Museum. That's awesome, but we got to get back to those teenage werewolves. One of the bodies they dumped gets up and stalks toward them. Its torso is covered in bandages. The nogitsune we saw in Styles' visions. One of the soldiers shoots it, but this has no effect. It soon reaches the soldiers. One runs, kicking over a container of gasoline, but... The one with the gun continues trying to stop the Nogitsune to no avail. The Nogitsune then grabs the gun and shoots the soldier before moving on to the soldier who ran. This soldier tries to get back in the truck but finds it locked. The Nogitsune repeats one of the riddles, what has a neck but no head, and tears the soldier's head off. In the original draft of the script, he says you and then there's like the gruesome death of that guy. Nice. I just want to say that while we were watching this and the Nogitsune said what has a neck but no head, he and I both said, you bitch, at the exact same time. Same brain. That was a long decapitation shot compared to the bisection in episode 201 Omega. They were shaving frames off that shot to get it past the sensors. Yeah, but that had entrails. Yeah, that's true. I think that's why I had so much more trouble with the sensors. In the present, Ken gets his classroom in order on a Saturday, only to encounter Styles possessed by the Nagitsune. Styles uses a fly to try and get Ken to tell him the location of Nishika's last tail, which is the oldest and therefore capable of creating the most powerful Oni. He's like a cat here, just knocking books off the shelf. How does he know it's hidden in a book? I don't think he does. I think he's just knocking things off the shelf randomly. And he just happens to pick books when the tail really is hidden in a book in that classroom? Just feels a little cheaty. I see what you mean there. Scott shows Kira the picture that Styles and Malia found with the body at Eichen House, dated 1943. A young woman in the photo looks exactly like Kira, leading her to conclude the woman must be her grandmother. Oh, that's such a great picture. He explains that they found the body along with the sheath katana behind a wall marked with a backward five. But it's not a backward five. We know this already. Pete, Scott is doing the best he can. Kira gets a text from her mom asking her to rush a package of reishi to the school to help Ken. Scott accompanies Kira to the school. Nishiko gives Ken the mushrooms, which allows him to cough up the fly the Nogitsune used on him. Scott is shocked that Styles did this. Luckily, Nishiko has been keeping the last tale, or Kaiken, with her ever since Styles' disappearance. This is different in the original outline. It says, able to talk, Yukimura explains that Styles wanted the Kaiken but didn't get it. Yukimura indicates the shelves. I moved it last night. Nishiko grabs the History of the World book off the shelf. She opens it to reveal the last Kaiken still inside. I thought you said your students wouldn't open a book. He looks to Scott and Kira. Some are smarter than others. Kira asks Nishiko to tell them everything, starting with an explanation about the photo found at Aiken House. Nishiko tells them that the woman in the photo isn't Kira's grandmother. It's Nishiko herself. In a flashback, we see young Noshiko slyly stealing a baseball left by a military officer. Oh, she looks fantastic. Scott says that would mean Noshiko's like 90 years old. Noshiko says it's closer to 900. What? I didn't realize my mouth was that bad. (laughs) Oh, poor Scott. Kira takes this in stride. That's some great moisturizer, Mom. Nice work. She asks her father's age. He says he's 43, but he has been told he looks mid-30s. 
Ah, again. Oh, Ken. Yoshika takes the sheath katana from Scott and pulls out the hilt. From inside the sheath comes the broken pieces of the katana blade. Oh, it's like the shards of Narso from Lord of the Rings. Whatever, you f***ing <laughs> I know. <laughs> the katana shattered in 1943 when it was used against a Nogitsune in the Oak Creek internment camp. Scott points out that Ken had told Allison and Isaac that there was no internment camp at Oak Creek. There were a few lines in the original draft that were cut here. Scott said, that quote up there. I was in class when you wrote it. He points to the board where George Santayana's famous quote has been written. Yukimura says, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Scott says, the last two years have taught me a lot. One of them is that I don't want to repeat anyone else's mistakes. Yukimura says, while that's admirable, at this point, it might be unavoidable. Have you learned a lot, Scott? Appreciate when he's trying to show growth and that he wants to learn so that yeah, he's I mean, not falling that's, into like, the same traps. That's I know, something. I know. It is. It's something. Somewhere Derek's ears are burning. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, shit. I didn't mean it like that. that <laughs> somewhere Derek's house is burning. Ken Why? and uh, Derek can just have a cup of tea and talk about how the Argent family can't be trusted. <laughs> <laughs> Ken says that Allison's family has a history of violence, and he didn't know if she was trustworthy. I mean, he's not wrong. I'm not going to tell Allison, Jack. Shit! The man has a point. As soon as anyone new comes to town, I imagine Derek just writes them a letter about how the Argents can't be trusted. <laughs> to whom it may concern. P.S. Don't trust Peter either. <laughs> <laughs> Sincerely, Derek Hale. The records about the Oak Creek internment camp were erased, and the camp was covered up. In grad school, Ken was obsessed with finding the truth about Oak Creek, and that's how he met Kira's mother. That's a better answer than the end of the show, How I Met Your Mother. Ken shows them additional photos from the camp. None of it explains where the Nogitsune came from. Nishiko says the Nogitsune came from her. In a flashback, we see a young boy running through the camp and going into the internee's sleeping quarters, where a young woman named Rinko passes out apples pilfered from the supply truck. I want to say all this was filmed in Long Beach. Interesting. I love the desaturated look that they went for with all these 40s scenes. Yeah, it looks great. And I think I pitched the name Renko due to my love of actress Renko Kikuchi. Love it. Nice. Those pilfered apples were pilfered by young Noshiko, who gives the baseball she also took to the boy, Michio. Oh, she looks so good in the period clothes. And the hair. Yes, everyone looks great, but I feel like she looks particularly great. I agree. Renko chastises Noshiko for taking the baseball. Another internee... Satomi says Nishiko takes too often and too much. Lily, who plays Satomi, is an accomplished TV director. She was nominated for a DGA award for directing an episode of Just Add Magic, and she's directed episodes of The Walking Dead, Criminal Minds, How to Get Away with Murder, and Partner Track, starring Arden Cho. She also directed an indie feature in 2012 called Model Minority, which she wrote as well. Wow. Yeah, that's really cool. I had no idea. While playing a solo game of Go, Satomi says she knows Noshiko thinks she's weak for following the rules. But while the young fox breaks the rules, the older, wiser animal learns the exceptions to the rules. This is our first instance of Go on Teen Wolf, right? On Colonel Minds, it was actually used in the pilot by Jeff. Apparently he just loves the game Go. This is jumping ahead a little bit, but she says learns the exceptions to the rules, but I feel like that doesn't really play out. Yeah, I don't think it actually works in this. Like what actually happens isn't an exception to any No, it, it's not, no. The sound of glass breaking startles everyone in the room. Michio has accidentally sent his baseball through the window, alerting the guards. Everyone scrambles to hide their contraband. The MPs come in and question everyone with one guard, Merrick, aggressively patting down Rinko. Another MP, Reese, calls him out. Reese tells the internees that they have to fix the window and that there will be an inspection in the morning. The other guards can't believe they won't be searching now, but Reese insists on the morning. After all, he says, it's a relocation camp, not a prison. Before he leaves and without the other guards seeing, Reese tosses the baseball back to Michio. In the present, Noshiko asks for Kira's help reassembling the katana. Kira won't help until she hears the whole story. So, you know, speed up, mom. Nishiko is hesitant about speaking with Scott present, but Ken insists that they should embrace unlikely allies in times of war. At the sheriff's station, Parrish withholds Chris's cattle prod while releasing Chris and Derek from custody, even though Chris insists he only uses it for hunting. Oh my god, Derek's face in this scene is just... <laughs> it is great. So there's something in the final script about Derek giving him a look, but it was in the original outline. It said, 
Next to him, an amused Derek tries to keep from rolling his eyes and fails. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't think it looked like an eye roll. It looked more like a flat glare. (laughs) (laughs) Only you and Styles knows the nuances of Derek's looks. (laughs) Yes, he's an open book to the two of them. He does a lot of eye rolls on the show, and this was not one of them. Stalinsky comes in, explains that he was the one responsible for authorizing their release, and assures Parrish he'll take care of the cattle prod issue. Stalinsky takes Chris and Derek into his office, where he explains that the specialist he spoke to about Styles told him, quote, they can't say for sure about Styles' brain scan. But Melissa told Stalinsky that Styles' brain scan was identical to that of Styles' mother, which is impossible. The only conclusion is that the scan is the Nagitsune's doing. During his time in the army, an officer told Stalinsky that defeating an enemy means taking away their hope. Someone's read Art of War. Stalinsky thinks the Nagitsune is trying to take away Styles' hope. I like how it cuts to Derek after Stalinsky says that. Don't worry, Stalinsky. You've got a human shield right here. He will jump in front of anything. Oh. <laughs> Sad but true. Very sad. Very true. Stalinsky asks for Derek and Chris's help in the fight for Styles' mind and body. Chris asks if Stalinsky means he wants their help to trap Styles. <laughs> Which isn't his go-to, usually. No, I want you to kill my son. <laughs> Argent. It's that meme. You mean trap him, right? You mean trap him, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love that meme. That Stalinsky gives Chris back his cattle prod. In flashback, we see young Noshiko running toward Reese. She grabs him and throws him against a wall for kissing purposes. Oh, I love this fake out. <laughs> Reese presses pause on the love vest to warn Noshiko about the amount of supplies she's taking, especially medical supplies. He worries that the other officers could find and confiscate the contraband and punish everyone until someone turns on Noshiko. Noshiko offers to put the bottles of aspirin back, but Reese tries to get her to let him help instead. He can be sneaking too as evidenced by a chocolate bar he smuggled for Nishiko. Kira interrupts the flashback with impatience. She doesn't want to hear about Nishiko's past love story. She wants to hear about how they can save Styles. Scott believes Nishiko's stalling because her Oni can come out once the sun sets. I just said a mood, Kira. Jeez. I want you to know about what a babe I have been for decades. Let a woman lay some foundation down for this story. <laughs> Scott and Kira try to get Nishiko to call off the Oni, but she says they won't want her to once she finishes the story. Speed up then, Mom. Cliff notes it. There's another bit to this exchange in the original script. Scott says, I don't think you know that, with reference to their claim that Styles is entirely gone. And you know why? There's something called chemo signals. I can catch scents that you'd never notice. And you know what I smell right now? Fear. Nishiko says, neither of us would argue that. Scott says, yeah, but it's a different kind of fear. It's the kind where you're afraid that you might be wrong. Nishiko can't help but glance at Yukimura, both of them looking to gauge each other's reactions. Scott continues, you brought the Oni. Can you call them off? Nishiko says, can I or will I? I do like that a little bit. I like the bit at the end, the can I or will I. That's good. But I I like that Nishiko is steadfast, that she is unwavering in her belief. I feel like the drama is better that way where she's like styles is gone there's no more styles that's the end all be all of it plus i feel like that's kind of expanding the power of chemo signals you could extract that kind of incredible nuance from a smell like fear of being wrong smells different from fear of other things i don't know it's like no no that's fear of being wrong the other one was fear of sharks so let's (laughs) Like, Let's I, calm that down. Just, that feels like a bit much for their superpowers. Yeah, yeah. I think that was a, a good excision. Solinsky, Chris, and Derek reach the Argent's apartment, where Allison lays out all the non-lethal materials she could find. Not sure I believe that's all she could find. I know they love lethal shit, obviously, but they also kind of love just f***ing with people. They probably have the world's largest collection of cattle prods. Currently, the plan is for Derek to try and pick up Styles' scent at Eichenhaus, where he was last seen. The other places Styles has been showing up are at the school and the hospital. You know, the four locations we have in Beacon Hills. Pretty much. Derek points out that they're repeating the same moves as before. Styles disappears, they go looking for him, and they walk right into one of the Nogitsune's traps. In the original script, Chris also points out, and now Isaac's in critical condition. Yeah, it seemed like everyone had forgot about poor Isaac in this episode. At least that one had a throwaway there. I had, if I'm being 
perfectly honest with y'all. Oh, wait, was the, is he still in the hospital from being electrocuted? Yes. yes. Oh, shit. <laughs> I forgot all of that. That was like yeah. two episodes, three episodes ago or something. Also did Will, clearly. <laughs> Allison wonders whether it would make more sense for them to wait and get Styles to come to them. But Derek makes another point. They can't just wait because the Oni will go after Styles when the sun goes down. Since Scott and Kira are currently working on the Oni problem, the group decides to split up and check Eichenhaus in the hospital before regrouping at the school. So they are just going to go do the same thing then. Apparently. Okay, then. Here's another question. Why did Allison give the order for Chris and Derek to be one group and herself and Stalinsky to be the other? Why didn't she put Derek with Stalinsky and then she could go look with her dad? She wants Derek to be her new stepfather. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> it's very odd it is odd right? yeah i mean it's a weird choice maybe it's just because she feels like she still doesn't trust Derek and doesn't trust him with Stalinsky. okay now that i could uh, kind of also see like i don't find it annoying yeah. that she doesn't trust Derek at this point though like she trusts her father could take care of Derek. she doesn't think Stalinsky could in case i don't know Derek suddenly went feral and attacked to them well i i feel like the thing is like Derek. And Argents are never a great combination. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Derek oh, and yeah. Stalinsky. <laughs> I don't know. And I don't know. That's what the start of this argument was. <laughs> I don't know. When Allison and Stolinsky leave the room and head towards the hospital, Derek catches Chris packing a few lethal options. I think there's some judgment in Derek's voice there. There's always judgment in Derek's voice. True. But I think he doesn't approve. In the original outline, it actually said, is Argent making sure he's got a few lethal options just in case, or is this going to be his actual plan? Argent insists he always goes prepared, but Derek has become wary of trusting him. And by become, we mean has been wary of trusting him since their very first encounter. <laughs> I know, it's by like, by one. become, I mean remain. Yeah, so yeah. He learned his last name was Argent. <laughs> is his first encounter them shooting at Scott or we don't know if that was the very first time he saw Chris, do Chris we? yeah we don't know I mean we don't have any reason to think anything happened yeah there's no reason to think that wasn't their first encounter together just because yeah our understanding is that Derek had just gotten in town yeah mm -hmm. yeah so they got in town basically at the same time right so. and so he he sees Argent when Argent and the hunters are attacking Scott and Derek saves him. Yeah. And then he actually speaks to Chris when Chris and the hunters go to, I guess, try to intimidate Derek, even though he hasn't done anything. I think it's that's what was happening with the whole- intimidating squeegee ever. They're just werewolf racist. So... I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. I do love that scene though. That scene is great. Meanwhile, Noshiko continues her story. She and Reese found ways to see each other in secret. How is it they're kissing and stuff and her lipstick is always perfect? The Nagitsune can riddle me that. Right? I'd like to know what kind she uses. It's called Full Makeup Team by L'Oreal. <laughs> Did you get me that? Yeah. Since he was being transferred to North Africa in a few weeks, Nashika was teaching Reese French. I think it's time for Kate's accent corner. No comment. <laughs> During one of these clandestine tryst, they overhear Merrick and Hayes, two other officers, talking quietly with the doctor. As Nishiko explains this in the present, Kira realizes she's holding a shard of the katana so hard that she's cut her hand. But when she wipes the blood off, Nishiko is already healed. Kira will be able to learn to do that one day. She already never gets sick. She'll never experience any common ailments, including pneumonia. That pulls Nishiko back into her story. In flashback, we see an outbreak of pneumonia ravage the internees. The doctor tells Reese they only got one box of medicine, and now they're out. But Nishika remembers seeing three boxes, not one. Dr. Liston was using Merrick and Hayes to sell the medicine on the black market, leaving the internees to suffer and potentially die, starting with the little boy we met earlier, Michio. Oh, it's so sad. Very. In the original breakdown of the episode, this was all very different. Nishiko and Rinko are in line to see the doctor who is giving vitamin shots to teenagers in the camp. The doctor is engaging as he talks about the importance of proper nutrition. Nishiko doesn't like this doctor, sensing something wrong, but everyone else is charmed. He has a small terrarium in his office with a lizard and lets the kids pet it. Nishiko and Rinko both get the shot. Later, Rinko has fallen ill. So have a lot of the other young people. Feverish, listless, etc. And peace come to remove them from their families in the barracks and take them to Eichen House, where the doctor is. 
Noshiko wants to come with Rinko, but the MPs won't allow it. It's only for the sick. Noshiko sneaks into Iken House and finds Rinko in a, in a row of other sick patients. She hears the doctor coming in, telling the MPs to wait outside. She hides under the metal bed as the doctor starts to examine Rinko, speaking into the dictaphone. He said that it's been 48 hours since the virus was injected in the patient, and she's already unconscious and the injection site is badly inflamed. The doctor actually caused the disease with the vitamin shots. As she slips out, two MPs spot her, but she easily fights them off and gets away. Wow, that is radically different. Yeah. Radically different. Later, Rinko, who is also sick with pneumonia, suggests they go to the administration and issue a formal complaint. Michio's father doesn't believe that will help, and neither does Satomi. Michio's father makes a Molotov cocktail saying he can make them listen. It's then that Noshika realizes she's spoken too soon, inciting a riot. The internees ran outside with bricks and other impromptu weapons, demanding to see the doctor who, along with Merrick and Hayes, is inside a car trying to flee. Tamlin Tamita kills this monologue. Hell yeah. Michio's father lights the Molotov cocktail just before Merrick and Hayes get out of the car, guns drawn. He hesitates when he sees Reese trying to de-escalate the situation. One of the soldiers pistol whips Satomi and her eyes flash yellow. A bitten werewolf. That's why she was always playing Go. It helped her keep calm. Bitten werewolves, Nishiko says, have a harder time suppressing their anger and keeping control. Good thing Scott never had that problem. Right? <laughs> you can tell Satomi's supposed to be a bad werewolf because she doesn't have eyebrows. Oh. That's what they did. That's no, how they do good. it. In the flashback, Satomi grabs the Molotov cocktail from Michio's father and throws it. When it lands at Reese's feet, his whole body catches fire. In the original breakdown, what happens to Reese is different. His name is also Michael. When Michael sneaks into the infirmary, he runs into the doctor and confronts him. The doctor admits to infecting the internees, but says he's justified. He describes the Japanese unit 731, which has started to weaponize disease. They released plague fleas in China, killing 400,000 people. America must be prepared to fight fire with fire. When Michael refuses to accept this and says he's going to turn him in, the doctor stabs him in the back. You just don't have the stones for war, kid. He leaves him for dead, maybe framing Nashiko. Wow, that's also super different. At the hospital in the present, Stalinsky and Allison stand in silence in the elevator. What an awkward elevator ride. And we've had some awkward ones in this hospital, but this is <laughs> up in the top three. Stalinsky then breaks the silence to say how impressed he is with Allison and her friends. They're strong, fearless, and even keep their grades up. Allison admits she's failing econ, which is Coach's class. Stalinsky says he'll have a word with him. I don't think Coach actually understands what econ is anyway. Yeah. In the original script, there was an extra bit of dialogue to open this scene. It said, standing in the elevator together, Allison throws an uncomfortable look at Stalinsky. Allison says, so did Scott tell you everything? I mean, about the Shugendo scroll? Stalinsky says, yeah, and I'd prefer to deal with the idea of my son becoming a werewolf after we've figured out a way to get the homicidal fox spirit out of him. Allison says, that's probably a good idea. The part that I'm confused about is where he says, deal with the idea of my son becoming a werewolf after we've figured out a way to get the homicidal fox spirit out of him. I thought the whole point of turning him into a werewolf was to get the homicidal fox spirit out of him. Right. No, I, I think he's saying that he's like, if turning him into a werewolf is what it takes, we're going to do it. I'll then deal with it later. Like having your child be now something else, no longer human. You know, that's like, I'll do whatever it takes to save him now. And then afterwards, I'll actually process what it actually means. It's very poorly phrased. But it yeah, because I was going to say, why does he say figured out a way to get it out? Isn't the whole point of the Shugendo scroll that they have a way? Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that's not. Yeah. Yeah. That's and that's poorly, actually that's something poorly that worded kind of confused me about this episode because mm -hmm. they're talking to Noshiko about trying to figure out a way to get the Nogitsune out of styles. Mm -hmm. But they haven't even tried the one thing that they think will do that. Mm -hmm. I don't really get that. Like, why, why wouldn't they try turning styles into a werewolf? And if that doesn't work, figure out a plan B. Wait, is that why they're with Nishiko? Or is Scott there to get her to call off the Oni? Well, I guess maybe it's just weirdly paced because when they first get there, Kira says the thing about at the start of the story of, I don't want to know about your Casablanca story. Mm -hmm. I want to know how to save styles. And then they don't bring up the calling off the Oni until after that. 
Yeah. Remember at the end, they get upset and say, you haven't told us anything we can use. That's, yeah. Because it feels like if they just, if, if they were just trying to convince her to call it off, they wouldn't even really need to hear the story for that. Yeah. Especially once they realize that she is trying to kill time until her Oni can come out. Yeah. I think, I think what this is, is at the end of the previous episode, we have the Shigendo scroll, which tells us a thing. Mm-hmm. But we can't use that thing because we don't know where Styles is. But we need the characters to be doing something. I think we always had the story, like the internment camp episode and the story getting us into it. And I feel like we have bent motivation to fit having this story here. Because you're right, the story doesn't actually give us anything other than the origin of the Nagitsune. There's no reason Scott can't just walk out and be looking for styles. If he did that right right at the very beginning, nothing actually changes. Like Kira or whoever stayed would learn the story about the origin of the Nagitsune. And that's all we get. But you're right, it doesn't actually impact styles. We have a potential solution. Right. And that's it. So, yes, I think this is an example of we wanted to do a thing, which was have this episode or at least the backbone of this episode. But we don't have a reason for the characters to need this information. And I think that's why Kira says we haven't learned anything to help Styles. Yeah, I feel like what would have made more sense would be just to adjust the order of events so that they don't find out about the Shugendo scroll until after the story that Nishiko tells. Because, I mean, I love this episode. I think it's a great episode. Visually, it's great. The acting is great. As you said, it talks about something important, even if it's framed in a way that obviously changes a lot of the historical details but one thing that makes it confusing in the context the fuller context of the season and how the events play out is we've learned something critical about Mm -hmm. saving styles previously and then it doesn't come up in this episode yeah it yeah they don't bring it up yeah because this piece of conversation as we said was in the outline but it's not in the episode so at no point in this episode do they bring up the fact that they learned this important piece of information that they believe is going to save Styles. I feel like the writing side of this is just how the season was broken. Like maybe we figured out where this episode would fall. And then we're like, we knew what we were working towards. And then we got to certain information in the story before we needed it. But it wasn't something we could easily change because I'm sure we were like, with Joe or whoever, you know, we were like, this is the episode where we're doing this story and we have to do certain things production wise. And we probably couldn't change those things easily. Like, like with where we're going to shoot and like when the scripts are ready and all that. So it was like, we just kind of ran into that. And I, I think that's why Kira says those things that it's just kind of a not great band aid to, to, kind of fix this problem because you're right i mean there's just no reason for scott to just not walk out (laughs) and be like "Ah, kira you can stay or noshika why don't you text us this in a long chain while we're actually looking for styles at least if there had been an acknowledgement of it like maybe they mention the shugendo scroll to noshiko and they say we want your opinion on that because i don't want to bite styles if i don't have to because I heard this really traumatizing story during 3A about the horrific death that someone can experience if they're bitten yes. and their body isn't receptive to it. Like maybe it won't be if the, you know, since Styles is possessed by a Nogitsune that doesn't want him to be a werewolf. So we would yeah. love you to give us a better plan A and then just have that little piece of dialogue right at the beginning of the conversation and just be yeah. like, Hey, we do know this piece of information, but here's why we don't want to act on it right now. Yeah, no, that would have that would have solved it. Where it's like we have a solution, a dangerous, dangerous solution that no one wants to try unless it's the only thing we have left. You're right. That that, that one line would have fixed it. Where it's like, hey, what have you got? We got a thing. Don't want to do the thing. 
Yeah. Can you give us a new thing? And she tells the story. And at the end is like, nope, he did. Here come the Oni, you know, and, and, and whatever, you know, so that you're right. That one, that one, one line could have fixed it. And cause you're right. Nobody mentions the thing they all know. Skolinski stops the elevator when he realizes Allison is in tears. So wait, now he recognizes she's upset. Wasn't he the one who pulled her over in season one when she was very upset? He noticed. He just didn't do anything about it. Yeah, I don't think he knew what to do. Ugh, emotions, gross. In fairness, men are often like that. I mean, our culture teaches men to be like that. Accurate. But this is Stalinsky we're talking about, and he is the perfect man. I don't feel like Stalinsky, as we know him now, would have done that. But I think they are still fine tuning some stuff then. And it was like, uh, this teen's girl's crying and I don't know what to do about it. Now, at least he does know what she's crying about, though, and I feel like he yeah. feels better equipped to deal with it because, like, you know, if it was like, are you crying because you're having dating issues with my son's best friend? I don't know what to do with that. Yeah. Is it like, Scott, I can't go on a date without your annoying son popping in. <laughs> 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 right. He wants to st- not get involved with all that, but now that he knows, like, what That's life or death. Shit she's going to, yeah. He's like, here, I can better relate to you because really what you're going through is adult issues it's not teen issues yeah right yeah all first seasons have some growing pains allison says she's not fearless at all she pretends to know what she's doing but really she doesn't know if isaac's dying oh yeah because isaac's still around in this hospital somewhere allison doesn't know if she made a mistake with scott what her dad is thinking or if Derek can be trusted Derek? What? What did Derek do? Besides, you know, save your dad's life like a day ago? Honestly. Did Chris conveniently forget to tell her that? (laughs) Derek has always done the right thing. I know there was the thing with her mom, but now she knows he was just saving Scott's life. I don't know what to do. I mean, if Derek was here, I'd stab him, I guess, but... (laughs) (laughs) It's so true, though. That would be great if, like, in a scene where, like, all the characters are together arguing about something, and all of a sudden she just stabs Derek, and everybody's like, oh, she's like, sorry, reflex. I am so just pulling this right back. Isn't that what the Team so Wolf sorry. movie's doing? Yeah, and then she gives it back. I to mean, her. kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. She just pulls the knife right out of Derek and then slides it right down on Isaac. We know we He's know he ill. Can. Show some respect. <laughs> Stolinski tells her she sounds just like a cop. I guess that's true i mean guy gets profiled by her dad they assume he's guilty and then they just go around making his life more difficult until it's almost impossible for him to bounce back you do sound like a cop damn i said what i said just then stolinski gets a notification on his phone after Styles started sleepwalking he had put in some security cameras and motion sensors not very good ones the product placement for this phone is pretty good it's actually relevant to the plot yeah it's not bad when Stalinsky pulls up the video feed, they see Styles sitting on his bed, staring up at the camera and giving them a creepy little wave. I love the creepy little wave. But do you really want to put a camera in your teenage son's bedroom? Well, his teenage son's been sleepwalking and appearing in dangerous places, so... You put it outside the door, you put it outside the window, you do not put that in the bedroom facing the bed or his computer desk. <laughs> <laughs> In Nishiko's flashback, the soldiers opened fire on the internees and hit a lot of them, including Nishiko herself. The rest of the internees flee. With her kitsune powers, Nishiko is able to fight off the bullets, but it left her body so weak and her heartbeat so slow that she appeared to be dead. Reese suffered an even worse fate. His body was covered in third-degree burns, and the doctor had already sold the morphine. He died in such pain that his screams echoed all through Eichenhaus. Shit. What a dick. Merrick and Hayes were tasked with getting rid of the bodies, while Dr. Liston was transferred elsewhere as part of the cover-up. They were all going to get away with murder. In the original breakdown, the doctor did not get away. Then it gets in a kills the doctor by stuffing rocks from the terrarium down his throat. How many stones do you have? One, two, three? And then he heads for the internment barracks. Did you have to read it like a Dr. Seuss book? (laughs) <laughs> I was trying to do no get today. I'm, I'm, I'm not Aaron Hendry, okay? I never said I was. Well, I don't know if there's a way to say that that doesn't sound a little bit susical. I think it's <laughs> a good thing that that didn't make it into the episode. It's one of those things that theoretically feels like it might sound cool and menacing, but 
doesn't. I think the idea of seeing him like stuff rocks down someone's throat is horrifying though. Yes. Yeah. But uh, the yeah. line with it didn't hit for me. Yeah. He's like one, two, three, and then looks to the camera and goes, three, and then number three appears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I started having doubts after I said Susan Gall. It's like, or is it more count? Hmm. Yes, it's the count. Count the count. <laughs> Noshiko woke up in the back of the truck as Merrick and Hayes drove out into the desert to dump the bodies. Next to her was Reese's body, covered in bandages. Oh, I love this villain creation story. Noshiko wanted the guilty to suffer for the crimes, but she didn't even have the strength to save herself from being burned with the rest of the bodies. She knew she was making a terrible decision, but time was running out. She called out to the ancestors for Kitsune Tsuki, possession by a fox spirit. She called for a Nogitsune to take control of her body and weaponize it against her enemies. But Nogitsune are tricksters, and this spirit took control of a different body instead. The Nogitsune's like, knock, knock, who's there? Your dead boyfriend, ha 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 ha. Damn. One dead boyfriend. Oh my god. This brings us to the events of the teaser. Reese's bandaged body rising from a pile of corpses. Ah, oh, that shot's so good. Aaron Hendry tearing it up. As her body slowly healed, Noshiko was able to sit up, but it was too late for her to do anything to stop the carnage. She can only watch in horror as he kills Merrick and Hayes and drives the truck back toward the camp. In that shot, we see him find a bomber jacket in the front seat of the truck and put it on, but they're in the army. I think at this point we were just like, f*** it, but it doesn't really make sense. Eh, so he traded jackets with the dude in the Air Force, or he went to a poker game. Who cares? Bomber jackets are awesome. They are awesome, but this is actually explained in the original breakdown of the episode. She goes cold and Reese gives her his bomber jacket. He says it was his brother's. They end up arguing about the war. She thinks all war is futile, but he thinks this conflict is just and noble, and he doesn't want to think his brother died for nothing. The Nagitsune gets back to the camp and corners the surviving internees as they try to escape through the basement floor of Eichenhaus. Oh, he's pulling a candy man and attacking the wrong people. It does make, make more sense to me here, though. Like, at least the Nagitsune just enjoys chaos and tricks. Candy Man seemed to have all of his faculties about him. I could never understand why he wasn't just attacking shitty pe white people like the ones who murdered him. That's why they changed it in the newest movie. When she's finally healed, Nashika goes back to the camp and encounters the slashed up bodies of the remaining internees. She goes to her bunk and pulls out a katana. How on earth did she get that thing into the camp? You know the answer to that, Kate. Nature's pocket. This is not seven. Okay, this is not the movie Seven. <laughs> For Kitsune's, their 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 nature's pockets are like little mini tardises, much oh bigger God. on the inside. Go to wrong genitals jail. <laughs> <laughs> As sundown nears in the present, Nishiko recounts how she found the Nagitsune in the basement of Eichenhaus and fought it with the katana. Get him, Nishiko! F*** him up! She struggles against the Nagitsune until Satomi joins them. While Satomi digs her claws into the Nagitsune, Noshiko runs it through with the katana, shattering it. Satomi's like, now let's just agree we both got a lot of people killed. And then they <laughs> high five. <laughs> and it freeze frames. <laughs> and it freeze frames. <laughs> oh god. As its host body dies, the Nagitsune spirit exits Reese in the form of a fly. Before expiring, Reese says, Coup de foudre. It's a phrase Noshiko taught him in French. Literally, it means bolt of lightning, but figuratively, it means a sudden, unexpected event, especially love at first sight. In the present, Noshiko tells Kira that a bolt of lightning is exactly what they need right now, to galvanize the broken pieces back into a functional katana. And Kira has to be the one to do it because she's a thunder kitsune. Kira isn't sure she trusts her mother after all she's learned. Scott's like, don't look at me. I have no idea what's going on. I think it was more of... I'm going to stay right out of this decision. This is a y'all thing. Meanwhile, Derek, Chris, Allison, and Stalinsky go to Styles' room. When did Chris have time to go shave? He just keeps an electric razor in his car. He's just doing that on like at the red lights on the way over. Yep. Styles isn't in his room anymore, but the chessboard labeled with sticky notes that Styles used to explain the supernatural situation to his father is out. Allison wonders if it's a message from the real Styles. They notice that Isaac's piece is off the board. I wish the sticky note with Isaac's name was wrapped around the top of the piece like a little scarf. You are not over the scarf jokes, are you? Never! You will go down with that ship, Kate. I <laughs> will. The scarf. Derek notices that his name is on the king. Because he likes you. 
Derek's piece is heavily guarded, but it's also one move away from being in checkmate. This leads Chris to believe that it isn't a message from Styles so much as a threat from the Nagitsune. He's at the loft and wants them to come there just as night is falling, which sounds like a trap to everyone but Stalinsky. Chris believes Stalinsky's too biased, but Stalinsky explains his theory. The Nugitsune isn't exactly a killer. It's a trickster, and the killing is a byproduct. The Nugitsune wants tricks, irony, jokes. So Stalinsky thinks what they need is a new punchline. So, like, Lance Morrison irony or real irony? (laughs) Oh, (laughs) What the Nugitsune doesn't understand is that I am the master of the dad joke. Back at the school, Tiara uses her powers to restore the katana despite her misgivings. Now Scott's face is like, that was so hot. Yeah. Also, please don't stab me with that. My previous girlfriend had a problem with that. (laughs) (laughs) Non-consensual knife play. (laughs) (laughs) Nishiko gives Kira the katana. She takes to it naturally despite not wanting to use it against Styles. Nishiko's power is hers now because if the Oni can't stop the Nogitsune... It'll be up to Kira. Maybe she can get a werewolf to help her, like Nishiko had all those years ago. She does have Scott. But Scott points out Nishiko didn't tell them anything they can use to save Styles. So again, he's not going to tell them what he found out about changing the host, huh? That's true. He should have been like, wait, I have information you didn't have. Yeah, as it is, he's basically like, you're not telling us everything you know, I think. I mean, I'm not going to tell you everything I know, but... And she consists that saving Styles means killing him to free him from the Nikitsune. Even Ken agrees. Sometimes, even when you learn from history, fate conspires against you, and history does repeat itself. The last person who said history repeating a lot was a really bad person, so I feel like I'm going to ignore that sentiment. Scott gets a text from Allison about the locked. Oh, it's their first text ever. They delete them all after they broke up. Kira sheets the katana and takes it with her. In a final flashback, we see young Nishiko carrying a jar with a fly inside to the Nematon, where she buried the jar deep in its roots. Ah, I'm sad we didn't show this at the end of the last season. Yeah, that was a good idea. I have those every decade or so. Rude! To yourself! In the present, Ken worries about turning children into killers. Nishiko reminds him that they're already involved. The ritual sacrifice that Allison, Scott, and Styles participated in brought the Nematon's power back and let the Nagitsune out. Flashback to them being all wet. A necessary and important flashback. There was a final line here from Nishiko in the original script after she said they let the demon out of the cage. She says, what happens now is the consequences we all have to face. Polinsky arrives at the loft where he finds Styles staring out the window. Styles greeting his father ends the episode. He like turns around and he's like, hey babe. Oh, dad. Hey dad. Hey daddy. And then both Polinsky and Derek react. (laughs) Oh my God. I love that. Oh, that's so good. All right, Wolfies. That wraps up the beta section for The Fox and the Wolf. And now we're about to dive into spoilers. Not just for this episode, but for the whole Teen Wolf series. If you want to stay spoiler-free for all of the excellent stories to come, jump out now and we'll catch you next week. But if this isn't your first time in Beacon Hills and you want to hear more, don't move a muscle. Here comes the alpha. That's the problem. We're all trying to help Fox the Fox. Listen, I'll understand if anyone wants to back out. I'm not going to be the first wolf to run from the fox. All right, wolfies. Now we're going to jump over to our interview with Gino Seegers, who played Kincaid on Teen Wolf. Let's have a listen. Kincaid makes, makes a, makes a, what's the word I'm looking for? Makes a mark, a splash (laughs) with his, with how, how he dealt with, uh, with Isaac when Isaac thought he was too cool for school. And then showing back up (laughs) unexpected for the the armored car it was just awesome it was fantastic so man i enjoyed the uh the the journey i was i was really hoping that it would it would you know be more of a storyline but mm-hmm. the producers at cinemax wouldn't allow me to come back from charlotte and it was a mess because oh, i was wow. doing banshee and, banshee, yeah. and team wolf at the same time mm-hmm. and because it was six hour ordeal 
uh, in the makeup chair every time I got Chayton's tattoos on. They didn't want to risk me being out here and having to get those on. And it was just a mess. So oh, I got gotcha. you. shame. Yeah. That's, yeah. That, that is a shame. But hey, I mean, you were on two shows at the same time. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah that was, there are that, worse that, problems to have. There are worse. Sir. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed, there are. Indeed, there are. Let's dive right in. How did you get into acting, sir? I, I came into the game late. Uh-huh. Uh, I was an international rugby player for many years, and I played I played rugby in uh, New Zealand, and I played in Canada, America, England, France. I, mean, I played a, a lot of different places. And um, when I got to New Zealand, I decided that my career with rugby, my athletic career was over because I was frankly too old. I ended up buying a business, a bouncing security business, and one of my employers said I had a cool voice and you know in New Zealand everybody talks you know kind of nasally eh? you know what you <laughs> and it took like this eh? you know so they, they they talk really up here and growing up in my family my uncles always told me to speak from the chest speak from the chest boy poof you know, <laughs> okay oh, you know. <laughs> long story short it sort of led to me getting an agent me doing some voiceover work at the radio station and and sort of one thing led to another, and here I am. Do you have a favorite genre to act in? You know, honestly, I like comedy. I really do like comedy. I really like the complexity of it, the technical aspect of it, just the visceral nature of comedy. Now, I ain't that good at it. <laughs> but, but I do enjoy working comedy because typically I'm uh, more times than not the straight side of that comedic duo. You know, I'm the Mo and they're the Larry and the Curly, you know? <laughs> gotcha. I like being a part of it. I like making, you know, comedic stuff or comedic material. But I realize that I'm not the funny bone in the family. You know what I mean? <laughs> I have my moments, sure. But I mean, I'm not I'm not the funniest of guys. So perfect harmonies. You want to do more, more things kind of along those lines? Absolutely. But you see, perfect harmony. Uh, Dwayne was a bit of a straight guy. It became funny because he was so unaware of the situation most of the time, you know? (laughs) Yeah. It's kind of funny, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I saw that you played Mufasa in the Lion King musical. Are there other musical roles that you'd like to play? Wow. I don't believe in my heart of hearts that there is a role that I'm suitable for on Broadway. I mean, really? I'm a boss. I'm a basso profundo singer. I don't sing that high, and and Mufasa was probably one of the only characters that I could have played simply because of my look and my my sound and my my range in terms of, of singing. And even then, Mufasa is a baritone tenor, so he's a little too high for me. But I was able to 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 muscle it up and and get used to that whole idea. In fact, Mufasa was my first acting job. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that yeah. is very I, awesome. I, dude, I owe a lot to Mufasa. I learned a <laughs> whole lot about, you know, layering, character development backstory, all these things that went into basically Scar's and Mufasa's first scene when they meet in his cave, in his lair. You know, understanding that backstory, which I had no idea that that sort of uh, work went into acting. I just thought you learned the lines and this is how you say it. And I didn't think that there was an actual internal engine pushing this story forward. I learned all of that doing the lion king nice that's awesome that's yeah so that's cool. a super way to put it yeah. Yeah, dude, yeah yeah and then having julie taymor there to sort of like give you the layout and give you the, the little fine nuggets that you wouldn't have ever thought of right. you know and having that i was like wow i mean okay this is how deep you gotta go in order to get this character out every night that's yeah. so cool. Real, real quick. What was it like working with Julie Taymor? Because I, I love her movies and she has such a such I'm a gonna, vision. Listen, I'm going to be 100 percent honest because that's the only way I know. <laughs> when she first addressed us as Mufasa's in the understudy, I thought she was crazy. I said, <laughs> this, this woman is out of her mind. man. What? I, 
uh, this show is going to be a wreck because I this woman and then by the by the very end, by the very end of what she was telling us in terms of the backstory, how Mufasa, when talking to Simba, when he was showing uh, Simba the Pride Lands and how Simba didn't quite get when Mufasa said, one day this will all be yours. He didn't understand that one day Mufasa would no longer be here. Mm-hmm. So when the, when under the stars, when he explains to them that the ancestors live in the stars and they will always be with you and that one day I will no longer be here. Simba finally understands that his father will be in the stars one day and he will hug. He hugs him, not because he's sad, but because he's going to miss him. And I said, oh, my God, this woman's a genius. <laughs> it went from awesome. it went from she's crazy to this is the most it, this is the most genius woman I've ever met on the planet. I mean, she, I can't say enough good things about Julie Taymor, you know, That's awesome. uh, and my, and, and in my rush to judge, judge Julie as a quack, I realized <laughs> that she's a genius and I never prejudge anybody from that day forward. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, I love that's that. That's so story. cool. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I think that you would slay as Hades in Hades Town. So it won Best Musical in 2019, uh, right before Broadway shut down for the pandemic. And I oh. believe that Patrick Page's role in that musical, he originated the role of Hades. It's like the lowest register for a role that for an originating role, because there's been like, you know, Norm Lewis sang the Phantom lower than every other Phantom did. He did like a baritone, but Patrick Page's register was the lowest of a, a Broadway musical where that was the origin, the way the music was originally written, I believe. Right, right. Yeah. So I just, I just wanted to say, I think that would be you really know, cool. Honestly, <laughs> honestly, I'll have a look into that because I've been looking for a way to get back into theater. Fantastic. So you were part of the Uncharted fan film starring Nathan Fillion, which yeah. is awesome. How yeah. did that come about? <laughs> the stunt coordinator for the the project itself was a guy that I worked with on a show called Pair of Kings. And the stunt coordinator was talking with the director of the show. And the director of the show was uh, a guy from Canada. His name is Alan Unger. Alan and the stunt coordinator were talking and Alan was saying, hey, I need somebody to play this character. Diego is a really imposing type of guy. And my buddy Joe was listening to him. He says, yeah, okay, okay. I want you to think of somebody like really imposing, like, like just stoic and imposing and scary. Have you ever seen the show Banshee? And uh, Joe was like, yeah, I've seen the show Banshee. And he says, well, there's this guy, there's this Indian guy on there named Chayton Littlestone. If you could get somebody like him, uh, I mean, I think that that's the kind of guy I'm looking for. And Joe says, well, hang on a minute. Let, let me see if I can find somebody. So he, he steps away and he calls me and I say, what's up, Joe? Uh, what are you doing between this date and this date? I'll say, oh, man, I'm, I'm not doing I'm doing whatever you want to do, man. Hey, you want to you you come and hang out? I can't really talk about it, but uh, we're shooting a little show. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of money in it. I say, man, it's just let's hang out. Let's have some fun. Then he hangs the phone up and he goes back to Alan and says, well, I got him. Oh, she found somebody like Chayton? I said, no, yeah, yeah, I, I got Chayton. <laughs> no, nah, wait, what are you talking about? You got Chayton. He says, no, you, you wanted Chayton. I got Chayton. He says, no way. So he calls me back. And says, hey, man, can we have can we set up a a meeting? I would really like to sit down and talk to you about Diego. I was like, oh, cool. No problem. Joe was the reason why I got the gig in Uncharted. That's fantastic. That's amazing. That's the best way to get a job. Is yeah, there someone yeah. else? It's like, can you get the guy? It's like, I can get, can, or can you get someone like this person? Like, oh, we're just going to get that guy. I already know him. <laughs> we're we're yeah, making this yeah. happen. That's so cool. So Ian Bowen, who played Peter on Teen Wolf, went on to be on Yellowstone. And I, so I think we have some overlap of Yellowstone and Teen Wolf fans. Would you like to talk a little bit about your experience guest starring in the show? Originally supposed to play a character that was going to die, the, uh, the brother of one of the other Native American girls, and he was going to die in the same episode. So Taylor calls and says, Gino, I really like you, but I'm not going to give you this job because this guy is going to die and I want you around a lot longer. I'm like, cool with me. And so the very next week, he calls me back and says, I want you to read for this character. And so I read for Danny Trudeau and Gil Birmingham 
I had spoken to Gil about Taylor, and I'd also spoken to Kelsey, Kelsey Aspel about Taylor, because I'd worked with Gil on Banshee, and I'd worked with Kelsey on Pair of Kings. And come to find out that we we sort of locked it in and nailed it, and he brought me on for that, but only because he was wanting to make a larger meal out of Danny Trudeau, his daughter and wife. And just make a meal out of that and make literally play Casey's Tonto, you know, a Tonto mm. to Casey's Long Ranger. You know, so Danny was going to be the one that that got him out of trouble when he really was in deep, too deep. Almost like a, a voice of reason or a, a, a sidekick type of, of character. Mm-hmm. But oddly enough, he gets pulled away to 1883. As he gets pulled away, the writers go in a completely different direction and write my character oh. off. Oh, that into sucks. No, into nothing. That's a bummer. That's a real bummer. But I love Taylor, and I really did love working with him. He was a great guy, great director. I mean, the kind of director that really wants a collaborative effort. He really wants to understand what's been going on internally in you as a performer. And we went over a couple of things, you know, two or three times, and he says, you know, Gina, I don't know if this is working. I say, I know exactly why. I know exactly why. Give me, let me stand back. Look, watch, watch this. <laughs> and so I'm warming up into this, right? Mm-hmm. So I try something completely different. And then I hear him say out in the in the village, in the video village, moving on. I'm like, oh, can I get one more shot? <laughs> He won't, he, he, he won't, back, back, back. <laughs> moving on. I was like, yo, hey, can I get another take, man? I think I can do it a little bit better. No, 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 we're good, man. I'm good. Like, Come on, Taylor, let me get one more shot. Hey, all right, one more, one more. We're out of here. I was like, okay, cool. Nice. I had to beg him for another take, you know? <laughs> That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome. Guy for another take, but he, he knows exactly what he wants. He knows exactly the shot that he wants. So he's not getting a lot of fringe stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not saying that to disappoint or to slight any other directors that are getting all the angles. Let me be clear. <laughs> I'm a cool with getting as many angles as you want. But with Taylor, he knows he's got the story somehow playing in his head. And he literally knows the angle that he wants, knows when how that's going to edit out, knows how he's going to transition from that to the next. I mean, he's kind of a genius, too, man. I've been honestly, I've been fortunate to work with some really in tune directors and in tune producers you know people that are really locked in right to the craft and locked into the, the content that they're creating so. that's awesome and it's also cool because that's another teen wolf connection because kelsey is on teen wolf i was just gonna she bring is. season up. five yeah. Yeah, she is she yeah, is so yeah that's i awesome. didn't get to work with her on teen wolf though I know that's such a bummer. Yeah. yeah. Neither did I get to work with her on Yellowstone, but we we shared screen together. So that was good enough for me. So you've done a lot of work in video games like the Mafia series, Lawbreakers, Horizon Forbidden West. Are you an avid gamer? Uh once upon a time, I would have you would have found me at home playing video games till my thumbs were sore. <laughs> nice. But you know, sports came into my life coming from where from whence I'm from, it was an avenue to a more prosperous life. Video games did not offer that to me at all as as a kid. And so really my life was spent running shuttles and doing pull-ups and wrestling practice and football practice and track practice and really just trying to get to the next level of college sports after achieving that, getting a degree and after achieving that, moving on in a professional world. And so really, I, I, I never really sort of grabbed hold of video game uh, like like that, because at that time, when I was coming up, mm-hmm. there, there was no there was no road to uh, making a living or making money or making uh, having a job with video. Games, right. You know. Yeah. yeah. I hope you get the chance one day to check out Forbidden West. It's a it's a lot of fun. I get all of the tweets and the the responses and on Instagram about Hikaru and and uh, how cool his character is. And I'm like, yeah, I did the character. I, I thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> but, you know, I've not seen it in the game. You know, I haven't se- I haven't actually played it and saw it come to life in the game. Right. You know. So, how familiar were you with Chotin Wolf before you became a part of it? Had you seen any episodes? 
my wife is an avid watcher of anything MTV. You know, she used to watch all kinds of shows on MTV. So she was watching Teen Wolf, and I would hear it in the background, and I'd walk past it and see it as she's watching it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I thought it was the old Teen Wolf. You know, the the guy in, in high school, what was his name? Mike. Uh, like Michael, Michael J. Fox. Fox. Michael J. Fox. Yeah. Michael J. Fox, right. I was thinking like that kind of Teen Wolf, kind of comedic mm-hmm. Teen Wolf. But this was a dark, sort of <laughs> dramatic, you know, I'm like, wow, this, this is kind of cool, you know. But, you know, I, I wouldn't think anything of it. And then I, I got the uh, audition and I was like, oh, yeah, Teen Wolf. And I said, baby, this is show Teen Wolf that you watch. She said, oh, my God, we got to work on this. I was like, all right. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's so, fun. so she was more excited about Teen Wolf than I was because I wasn't sure if I was going to be right. You know, when, mm-hmm. as an act, as a performer, you, you go through these things. You say to yourself, OK, what are they actually looking for? You know, it didn't say specify w- what type of person they were looking for. It just said, you know, ambiguous or it just said uh, any ethnicity. I was like, so that opens it up even wider. So mm-hmm. like, wow, I mean, so what do I have that that could set me separate me from everybody else? Oh, I have a different sound. So let's try to use that. And let's try to make it as scary as and, and as, as intimidating as possible. We uh we booked that one, and uh, we were really excited when we did. We were really excited. That's awesome. Oh, that's yeah. so awesome. Fun. And yeah. Kincaid definitely stands apart. I mean, his voice for sure. But I, and I think maybe yeah. you kind of expect someone with a, a wonderful voice such as yours to go big. And like when you meet Kincaid the first time, he's just coming down those steps, and he's just. Keeping it, keeping it very yeah. low and quiet, yeah, keep- and it's and it's so fun and 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 interesting, you know, especially yeah. after Isaac's swagger coming in, <laughs> and then he tries to pass off some information on you, and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I know this story, and yeah. it's it's just so much fun. So it's a really fun scene. I had a blast with it, man. I, again, like I said, I was just really sad that we couldn't expand that role a little bit more. They asked me to. They they called me and said, you know, we 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 want you to come back, we want, but. Cinemax wouldn't let it happen, so it's definitely a bummer. We have like to definitely see a bummer. Yeah, yeah. That would have been fun. you know, I, one of the one of the producers asked me. We were in the trailer, the lunch trailer, and I'm sitting there and I'm eating. She, where she says, "Hey, you know," I say, "Hey, how are you liking? It? Oh, I'm loving it. It's great." And she literally says, "Why aren't you an alpha?" And I says, "That's a really good question." That's a good question. That is a good question. I can't answer that. Only you can. <laughs> <laughs> And so I was thinking when she called me back that they were going to try to somehow write me in as an alpha and maybe align our forces together. You know, my mind went completely crazy at that point. Of course. No worries. I'm thinking all kinds of crazy things. Like now I'm I'm going to be Tyler Posey's alpha partner of some sort. You know, I was thinking of all kinds of backstories at that point. Well, we did just have the new movie and maybe it'll get a sequel. So... Oh, well, well, yeah. well f- fingers crossed, man. I yeah. hope so. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah absolutely. Good. Definitely. Definitely. Absolutely. So I'd actually wanted to ask you, did you get any additional backstory on your character or did you come up with any on your own? Whenever I book a role, I sort of immediately start journaling as the character in his voice. So I have somewhere to start. Now, generally, most times they don't give you any type of backstory. They just give you some pieces here and there. So those pieces I can easily add into the story that I'm currently created. Mm-hmm. So I, I try really hard to bring something to the table when I get to set. And when those conversations are brought up about where this character is in this particular moment or with the director or the producer wants to talk to me about a backstory that I've created, hopefully that has aligned with their vision for the character if not they can interject and help me understand the direction that the character needs to go in and i can make that adjustment on the spot yeah it's very interesting yeah mm-hmm. it's a process well in which we're always interested in hearing about because every actor yeah. has their own process and yeah, every, just... every, yeah and there's no there's no right way there's no wrong way mm-hmm. it's just right whatever whatever gets you to the result that that's mm-hmm. believable and honest and truthful and reacting truthfully under these make-believe circumstances, right? Who on the Teen Wolf set, cast or crew, would make the best alpha? Oh, my God. It'd be Kincaid, man. Stop. <laughs> 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 no. 
I like Posey as now. I think his character has enough charisma and enough swag, enough cachet. Uh, he's learning. He's becoming a man. He's uh, and he's becoming an alpha basically as he as his journey grows. I liked him as as a as an alpha. Now, I guess my it's a close it's a close choice between Dylan and uh, and Tyler. Nice, nice. Yeah. Well, you're definitely not the first person to mention Tyler. He, he, he's, sure. he's been, sure. That's been the answer for uh, a, a number of people. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So did you get a chance to meet Dylan? Because I know that you didn't get to share any scenes. Yeah, with him, unfortunately. Briefly. Yeah, briefly. We met briefly. I was on set while he was working. And I was just on set until he finished working, and and I got a chance to sort of meet him briefly. He's a nice guy, mm. nice guy. He's a, he's 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 a very mm. focused individual, and I, I kind of like that. Yeah, I kind of like I kind of like guys like that. Nice. Uh, I, I I don't I don't I mean he needs his space to get it get his <laughs> get his grind going, you know. And I kind of I kind of respect that. I like him a lot. So, what was working on Teen Wolf like compared to other shows you've done, like Banshee or Perfect Harmony? Well, of course, Banshee was probably one of the hardest roles for me to perform because they couldn't find a stunt double to match me. And when they did, he couldn't match me. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. it, like, so he, the way he moved was a lot less fluid than my movement. So they only used him for the very large stunts. Jumping off of a waterfall, jumping off, off the second floor balcony, um, those big stunts. But running down the street, I had to do all of that <laughs> because he he was more of a bodybuilder type, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So he ran like this. Gotcha. You know, and me, I, I ran like a guy running. <laughs> 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 and so uh, Greg, in in all of his wisdom, said, Gino, man, you think you could do the running, man, because it's really not going to match up very well because you run very much like a guy running. Uh, and I said, hey, man, no problem. Let's do it. So 27 setups later, Oof. I was like, Oof. oh, oh, my God. <laughs> You're killing me, Greg. <laughs> Chayton was really taxing, whereas mm -hmm. Dwayne, was almost easy when it came to that that level of physicality. He wasn't mm -hmm. very physical at all. Team Wolf, there was a little bit of both. Uh, the physicality was there, but it was more in presence as opposed to physicality. Mm -hmm. You know right. what I mean? Whereas Chayton was all of that rage, anger, boiling, deeply dark. He was a lot of things going on at once. I won't say there were more layers, but I'll just say it was a bigger onion. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. You know gotcha. what I mean? Yeah. They're, they're yeah. literally onion, sizes of the onion. You know what I mean? <laughs> Perfect Harmony was a little onion. Nice onion, but a little onion. Mm -hmm. Teen Wolf was a, a bigger onion. Not as big as the Chayton onion, but still a pretty big onion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. On the, so on the subject of stunts, it looked like you did all of your own stunts on Teen Wolf. Was that the case? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there, weren't, there weren't major stunts, though. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? All the stunts I did on Teen Wolf, I'd done 10 times as as much on Banshee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the stunts I did on Pair of Kings were more involved than the ones I did on Teen Wolf. Yeah. But the stunts on Banshee, the fight choreography alone, the amount of time we spent offset preparing for the fight scene. I don't have to be on set till Thursday night. Monday morning, I'm in the gym fighting. Yeah. <sighs> Monday morning, Tuesday, mm -hmm. Wednesday. And then Thursday morning and then Thursday night, I'm coming in, you know, for the fight scene. We're going right. to work all night and do this fight scene. Mm -hmm. So I'm working the whole week preparing for the fight scene. Wow. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's awesome. They do fight scenes. Uh, I don't know. Some stunt coordinators do it differently. But coordinator with Banshee basically did fight choreography in moves. Mm -hmm. So if you had a 200, 200 move fight, that means a punch, two, duck, mm -hmm. three, duck. Swing four. So these are these are all count. He counts the moves out, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So he goes from one to four. We get one to four. Bang, bang, mm -hmm. bang, bang. From the angle that we want. Then if we want a different angle, we'll take a different angle. One, two, three, four, and we get those right. And so then we go for the for the next bit. We're gonna go five, six, seven, eight. We're gonna start with three. And so we go uh -huh. three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
right? And so yeah. when you get all those angles, Interesting. we're going to get 9, 10, 11, 12, but we're going to start at 7. So it's 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, you know? So <laughs> it, it's like, ah. Oh. And at the end of it all, you get this beautiful shot that you piece together and it looks like one whale motion, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. And then we do a wide where we fight the whole, we do the whole fight scene, you know, just yeah. do it outright, you know? So in the wide, you got to know from one to 200. Right. And then you got to do small pieces as well when you, when, the, when the camera's in tight. Because you can't do the whole fight with the camera in tight. You just can't. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it's, it's, yeah. it's not logical. Right. That sounds right. crazy. You're going to punch yeah. a lens. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that or it's going to get so messy that the, the guy can't keep up with you. So he doesn't right. know. The, the camera guy can't learn all those moves. He can only learn, okay, boom, 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 boom. Okay, got it. Boom, 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 mm-hmm. boom, boom. And he, he's moving the yeah. camera like that. But if he had to do the whole fight scene on, on, on a, you know, gorilla, nah, it's not going to work. That'd be rough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would be hard, yeah. For him to yeah. keep yeah. up with us. And heaven forbid, I slip in the middle of the fight and I'm, I'm falling over this way and the fight, you know, I'm into the camera and my head mm-hmm. cracked and yeah, we got a problem. Yeah. yeah. That's so cool. You talking about like all the moves and stuff because uh, I used to watch a lot of Kung Fu movies in oh, high school yeah. and college and there was a, a choreographer and they would shoot those MOS without sound, like all those fight scenes because like the choreographer, someone like Yuan Wuping or somebody, they're calling it out. They're saying one, two, three. And so that they yeah. are doing it at a certain rhythm and all that. So that's so interesting that that's still how it is. That it's still constructed right. with every movement is a move and you have to figure out right. how it works because mm-hmm. the person opposite you has to do their move that matches your move. And, and so it's, it's, and, 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 and stuff like that is so cool. Right. And with those yeah. karate movies, you got like 30 people fighting one guy. Right. So they, they got to they got know, okay, these three are going to come over here mm-hmm. on five, and these two are going to come on seven, or this guy's going to come on 18, and I got to yeah. have all that choreograph. That's It's crazy, but it, it's literally a dance. Yeah, it's it's uh, wonderful. It's so yeah. interesting to hear about, especially from a first person's perspective. So, <laughs> so yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, how long did it take to rehearse the fight scenes on Teen Wolf compared to Bantu? Was it shorter? Uh, it, it, was, it was really short. I mean, there weren't really extensive fight scenes for mm-hmm. Kincaid. Mm-hmm. Kincaid right. didn't have an extensive fight scene. So basically, all we had to do was make sure that the punches landed. And when I say mm. the punches landed, they landed for the camera. You right. know what I mean? Because if a punch right. like this, if the camera angle is there, you're not going to see it, right? <laughs> but if yeah. the punch is like this, and he's kind of land. Right. right? Mm-hmm. He, doesn't act, he doesn't actually hit me. But it lands. But he, I'm I'm just doing this same all the time, I'm doing mm-hmm. this, right? Yeah. But just that right. right there, that lands, especially with my reaction. So we just had to make sure that the punches landed and that the camera angles were were were, were tight, and it, it was you know believable. Fantastic. What was the process like getting transformed into a werewolf? Well, I got my teeth mold. I got my own mold, right? Which mm-hmm. oh. which I understood was a big deal. Because the special effects artist was like, hey, man, you're getting some teeth. I was like, well, <laughs> what does that mean? That means they're going to want you to come back. I was like, oh, really? He said, yeah. And I was like, oh, man. Yeah, so I got my mold, right? I was excited. Becoming a werewolf was literally a highlight of my life because I think as a kid, the only thing that I wanted to be for Halloween that didn't have a sheet over my head was a werewolf. Nice. I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be Dracula. I didn't want to be, you know, clown. I didn't want to be any of that stuff. I didn't want to be Batman. I wanted to be a werewolf. <laughs> nice. So, <laughs> nice. My whole so life, you know, my whole life, I was riddled with the whole mythology of werewolves, lichen, and all that sort of stuff. And it's just, it's, it's just a, it's a cool mythology. And the, the, of course, the, the the moon coming out, the silver bullet. All that stuff, man. <laughs> Michael Jackson's Thriller. You know? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. All that stuff, you know. I was just absolutely. Geeked, you know, yeah. So that was that was a big part of my childhood. Yeah, I was just geeked out to be to be a werewolf finally. Nice. It is the best supernatural Aww. creature. Oh, it is, man. It, it is. is. <laughs> it is. So you worked with two directors on Teen Wolf episodes, Jennifer Lynch and Tim Andrew. What was it like working with them? generous a lot of directors can be quite you know quite stern you know giving you line reads and things like that I'm, I'm i roll with the punches it doesn't bother me at all but i really do like the collaborative sort of effort they just really put you there and turn you loose and say hey make it your own 
and and give it y'all. If you give it too much, we'll let you know. If you're not giving it enough, we'll let you know. As long as you're inside the story and and you're pushing the story forward, there was never any qualms, you know. So fortunately, I was able to to do my homework for Team Wolf and help push that story forward. That's fantastic. Do you have any fun memories from the Teen Wolf set that you'd like to share? Arden says to me, oh, my God, I'm going to jump on your back. Uh, I hope I'm not too heavy. Oh, my God. I mean, you're going to be OK. I don't want to jump. I don't want to hurt you. I'm like, hey, you know, don't, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm good. But no, I'm really, I'm really. Hey, man, just jump on my back. Man, okay? don't, don't worry. About it. <laughs> uh, OK, all right. I'm going to jump on your back. Okay, all right. OK, you jump on the back. So she jumps on my back, right? She says, boom. She says, oh, my God, am I too heavy? I said, are you on my back? <laughs> <laughs> Did she jump yet? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's That's so cute. She, she That's can't cute. be 100 pounds, man. So, oh, my God, I'm going to jump on your back. I don't want you to. Stop. What are you talking about? You're 100 pounds. <laughs> I mean, I was 200, Aww. I was 270 at the time. What are you talking about? You're 100 pounds. <laughs> That's nice. adorable story. That's adorable. I love that. That's adorable. Yeah. Well, Gino, are there any upcoming projects you can tell us about? I think I can tell you about Road to Bethlehem. Uh, this already came out on Dateline. Yeah, that's going to be coming out this holiday season. Nice. It is a nativity musical movie. Nice. Very nice. So Sony is really excited about it. It'll be a, in a theater near you. We, we're really excited about it. Uh, Adam Anders. And I worked together on Perfect Harmony, and he couldn't be more excited. It's a project of love that he has done, a passion project that he's been working on for years. And the pandemic basically gave him the time he needed to get this thing done. I'm really happy for him. It could not have happened for a better person. Uh, Adam is uh, and his family, um, his brother Alex, I mean, just really good people. They're the guys behind the music of Glee. Nice. And uh, so they are consummate professionals, and they really just want to put out the best product they possibly can. And I couldn't be more honored to do it. I would have gone to Spain for free. I, I told them, I said, bro, I would have gone for free. You don't even have to tell me how much the deal is worth. I don't really care. I'm just going to go and have some fun, hang out with my boy Adam. And... Uh, yeah, I, I, I would have done that job for free. But there are some other projects on Netflix that are coming up that I can't speak about. But they are uh, uh, animated projects that I'm really excited to be a part of. Dang, man, I can't talk about them. But uh, again, uh, it's something that I'm I'm super, super, super stoked about. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of other things that I'm doing that are really sort of, uh, uh, again, sort of passion projects that that uh have not been released yet there's one called second chances it's an independent film and uh ryan ochoa who i who i worked with on pair kings he's one of the writers uh we've done some work together before and uh he's such a good kid it's hard to say no to ryan and um he's got a, a all-star cast you know uh he's got his sister in it he's got no uh i can't pronounce his name Noel g he's calling himself Noel g I you don't don't be mad at me, but David uh <laughs> David Deloise is also a part of it. Uh Jason Earls is a part of it. So he's got a, a huge cast of people that's in the movie. And it's it's supposed to be coming out here relatively soon. Fantastic. Relatively we'll soon. definitely yeah. have to stay tuned yeah. for that. Yes, we will. Keep an eye out for that. Absolutely. And then, we will. then there's a sci fi uh show, a sci fi movie called Mischief Upon Mischief. And it's really it's really strange. I mean, I did this, I, I shot this thing years ago and just thought, oh, well, it's never going to come out. And finally it comes out uh, directed by Ken Gamble, written by Ken Gamble. And uh, he's finally decided to put some effects onto it. And it really does look good. I was shocked. I was like, <laughs> Fantastic. man, dude, you're doing a great job with this thing, man. I was shocked. So that's going to be coming out hopefully very soon in the Northwest. So this is a limited release. But it's going to be coming out really soon. So that's awesome. Fingers crossed. That's fun. Yeah, yeah. I hope yeah. so. I hope it's so. All very exciting. Yeah, yeah, very exciting. It's it's awesome yeah. that there's so much coming. So that's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Well, Gino, this has been an absolute pleasure getting to it talk has. to you yes. and to talk about your fantastic career and how yes. it all led to Teen Wolf. 
which is awesome, which is the thing <laughs> that we all love and why we're here right now. So uh, thank you so much for coming on our yes. show and just talking thank about something so that much we love. For it's taking been the such time. a pleasure. Yeah. Mine. The pleasure's been mine, guys. We had a great time talking with Gino, but now it's back to spoilers. Okay, did we ever talk about the idea that Nishika regenerates like the doctor from Doctor Who? Like, she goes as long as she wants in a given body and then starts over again? That might be how it works. So we did not, but that's a very interesting idea. So that was something that you guys had discussed in the writer's room? Oh, I don't remember. I was just thinking about that when we were oh, it's watching the episode. Is that how it works? You've been considering. Yeah, okay. she ages as long as she wants, and then she's just like, 16 or whatever, and then just, like, moves forward again, you know, that she can just, or I bet she could probably just be, like, whatever age she wants to look, that's how she does it, probably depending on where she lives and how, if she's been there in the past, you know, it's like, oh, I was here 50 years ago, maybe I should be a little older now, <laughs> just in case anyone's still around, or if it's like, oh, I was here 200 years ago, that's ah, fine, well, I can do whatever I want, <laughs> you know, so. That's interesting. Yeah. We see a lot of different glowing eye colors on Teen Wolf, and I kind of wish the Kitsune color wasn't orange. It looks too similar to the Bitten Werewolf yellow. Yeah, I had that thought too. Since Nishiko is a celestial Kitsune, I believe, it would have been cool if she had something similar to what Galadriel had in the Lord of the Rings movies. All the characters have an eye light when you're making movies and TV shows, you know, just kind of a single prick of light to make the, the eye stand out. But Galadriel's is a circle of stars. Something like that would have been cool. Something, you know, otherworldly to set her apart from the other supers. Do we ever actually talk about her being a celestial Kitsune on the show? I don't believe I so. That. But I, I, wonder. I think that's what she is. But I think because in the the Kitsune book, they it's a celestial Kitsune I think they're talking about in there. I believe in the writer's room, we, if not determined that, we were like, that's probably what she is. It just never came up. I feel like if I had been Kira when she said, I'm not a thunder Kitsune, I would have said, what kind are you? I feel like that's the obvious question, right? I think you're right, yeah. And even if it ultimately isn't, germane to the conversation it could have been like they're desperately searching for possible solutions it might be worthwhile to know what powers her mom has mm -hmm. yeah i agree when she like wields her own katana she opens like a bifrost type thing and they can teleport to different places that would be fun that would be dope is what that would be <laughs> So for this one, the original breakdown had it extending the events of the episode extending into what we see in the next episode. Like they actually get to the loft, find Styles there. Oh, interesting. And then as the fight's breaking out, we have Styles calls Scott and says, I know you're with Nishiko. Do you hear this? And he holds up the phone to the sound of gunfire. Mm -hmm. He tells Scott that the Oni will kill Stolinski and the others who are now trying to protect him. The only way to save everyone is to kill one person. He tells Scott to take the katana and stab Nishiko through the heart with it. And then he hangs up. Scott and Kira race to the loft on Scott's bike. And then, yeah, it's intercut with like Nishiko taking the firefly to the Nimiton. And then we have the door slides open. Kira and Scott bursting inside to discover Stolinski, Argent, Allison, and Derek all alive. No only to be found. He, Scott says, where are they? Where Styles? But in the confusion, no one's all Styles leave. They don't know where the only are or what happened. None look particularly relieved, however. Allison turns to Argent. Were you really going to pull the trigger? He says, I think I was. Check the firing pin, she says. You removed it? She nods. He says, that's why the women are the leaders in our family. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And I like the fact that she didn't actually trust her dad. So she took yeah. the firing pin out. That's cool. Hey, she said earlier she didn't know what her dad was thinking, but it seems like she actually. Yeah. Did. Yeah. No, so... she did. She was right. She was right on the money. Yep. Hey, Lydia's not in this episode. I know. It sucks. She's her cover. Maybe she's sitting at Isaac's bedside. <laughs> <laughs> they take turn. They have like rotating shifts. She like Melissa comes in with some medicine and she's just sitting there with like with the ring dagger just spinning it. You know, she's like, Oh, I found this. <laughs> I'm never giving this up. I know. It would have been in addition to just making more sense, it would have been interesting if Scott had brought up the werewolf thing, because we know that what Noshiko and Satomi did separated Reese 
from the Nogitsune. So we haven't seen Kate come back yet, right? But we did have the conversation between her and Chris in season one, where she asks if you could be turned from a scratch. And Chris says, if it's deep enough. Yeah. And so that would have begged the question, did running him through with the katana actually do anything to separate Reese and the Nagutsune? Or was it just the fact that Satomi stabbed him with her claws and got in so deep that she turned him and that was what separated them? And then essentially Noshiko, by running him through with the katana, didn't do anything for the separation they were already going to separate she just killed reese that's an interesting idea that is an interesting idea that is that's cool it would have been reminiscent of what they did at the end of season two with buffy and angel because willow's spell separates angel and angelus and so buffy's just left to kill him by running him through with the sword like a show that Will has not watched. It rains. Yeah. Buffy the Vampire Slayer Hunter Killer. You know who shows that they suck in that episode? Xander. Yeah. And it never comes back. It's so annoying. Mm. That concludes this week's episode of Return to Beacon Hills. We hope you had as much fun listening as we did talking about all things Teen Wolf. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at RTBH Podcast and Tumblr and TikTok at Return to Beacon Hills. If you'd like to ask us questions or offer suggestions for future topics to discuss, you can email us at returntobeaconhills at gmail.com. Join us here next week when we discuss Season 3, Episode 22, Devoid. Rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast goodness. Five-star reviews get a shout-out. Have a great week, and we'll see you again soon on Return to Beacon Hills. Dude, it's Beacon Hills.